Mesdames les vice-rectrices, messieurs les vice-recteurs, monsieur le doyen, monsieur le Madame vice-recteur, Dean, Mr. President, it's a great pleasure for the University of Geneva to be able to welcome such a large number of people in person in this auditorium for this right conference, which you have all been eagerly awaiting. It's also a privilege to be able to welcome you remotely. That's something which the pandemic has enabled us to develop in our university, to hold events like this in person and also to be in touch with people who are attending remotely and who maybe are unable to attend in person. So we have uh, re-established physical contact, but we have also retained the impact that was rendered possible by the development of these audiovisual means, which enable us to meet both in person and remotely. The right conferences are uh, an occasion which the Geneva public uh, eagerly awaits every two years, uh, very eagerly, and your presence this evening uh, attest to this. And uh, to the University of Geneva, together with the Wright Foundation, is very keen on disseminating scientific culture and to have these occasions which enable renowned speakers to establish a contact with the people of the city, even though the subject matter is often quite complicated, but in a manner which is accessible to everyone. I believe today, more than everyone, we need to develop contact with the city on scientific subjects. We've been able to observe over the last few months that the public is uh, eager to take advantage of these contacts. They really want to understand. We have a need for communication. And thanks to the Wright Foundation, we are able to do this and have been able to do so over the years. We've been able to attract a large number of speakers and scientists uh, to Geneva from all over the world, Nobel Prize winners uh, and winners of other prizes. So these right conferences are eagerly awaited by the Geneva public, but um, our events um, go over and beyond uh, these events here in Geneva. Our aim is to disseminate the progress of science to the largest number of people, and this also forms part and parcel of the university's mission. The foundation supports the projects of the University of Geneva. As they help us to disseminate science to as broad a public as possible. I would like to thank the Wright Foundation for the support they've given to the Faculty of Sciences. Sciences they've developed a number of venues uh, which the public can come to to understand uh, uh, mathematical and uh, scientific and uh, other uh, procedures. It is our pleasure this year to welcome a first-rate uh, speaker, Hugo duminil Copin, who will be introduced in a moment. It's also an opportunity to project on the walls of our university, Uni Bastion, the Sans et Lumière show, which many of you have probably already been able to observe. It started on October the 31st and continues until November 21st. I invite you to go to the Parc des Bastions to enjoy this illumination of the walls of the Bastion building. This is a way of uh, enhancing the uh, heritage of uh, Geneva University by means of this Sans et Lumière show. I would like to thank all the people who have made that uh, show possible. I will now give the floor to the president of the Wright Foundation, Thierry Courvoisier, whom I would like to thank for being present this evening. Enjoy the evening. Thank you, Mr. Rector. It's a pleasure and not to uh, be with you this evening, and uh, it's not by chance. The spectacle that was just referred to is continuing until 
November 21st and for our foundation it's uh, a means to contribute an element of scientific culture to the population and not just to content ourselves um, with uh, people who simply sit on university benches. The way we see it, culture is there for everybody to benefit from, not just university students. Taking uh, culture and science to uh, where people are is a good way of fulfilling our mission. And I believe it's important to establish a uh, broad scientific culture for a broad public. The last uh, one was uh, seen by 50,000 people. Last year we had a colloquium. We were not able to hold the symposium in person in full. But we maintained a link between the show, the spectacle, and the more academic part of our communication efforts. And that's why we have set up this lecture with our colleague Hugo Duminil Copin. We are doing so with the collaboration of the university, which shares our vision of seeing the necessity of establishing a link between uh, uh, spectacle and academic efforts. It's uh, by no means just a mathematical effort. Although it is fast and beautiful and uh, has sounds and motion, although the show is not academic, it has an intellectual substance which is by no means negligible. Now, while major mathematical advances have taken place at all times and in all regions of the globe, many of them in modern times have been achieved in the Western world, and one can th reflect about the link that there may have been between these mathematical advances of the last century and Western strength, which was marked by colonization involving uh, often violent uh, imposition of Western culture in many parts of the planet. So this is just one reflection among many others which might uh, result from this show. This evening we are going to be reflecting about uh, uh, chance and whether chance really exists. Elise is now going to introduce to us Hugo Duminil Copin. Thank you for your words of introduction, Thierry. Um, one year ago, I had to introduce uh, Alain Cohn uh, in front of a, uh, uh, an empty auditorium. So it's a great pleasure to be able to uh, introduce Hugo live and in front of a real audience. First of all, I would like to mention his age. He's uh, the youngest speaker uh, we will have this year, we will have had this year and also last year. Um, and we also congratulate him on having become a father recently. He's uh, a professor at the University of Geneva. Uh, University of Geneva. He's also a professor at the Institut des Hautes Études Scientifiques in Paris. He won the uh, uh, New Horizons Prize in Mathematics in 2017 and the uh, Rollo Davidson Prize in 2012. Uh, the Early Career Award of the International Association of Mathematical Physics in 2015, and also in 2015, the PECO Lecture at the Collège de France. He is uh, brimming with ideas and enthusiasm, and we wish him a very long and successful mathematical career. I would like to refer you to a uh, 2020 article of uh, Campus, which refers to uh, theorems and um, uh, he uh, studied in uh, France and then he came to uh, Geneva and he studied under Stanislas uh, Smirnov. He submitted his uh, dissertation in 2012, which is uh, between uh, probability and transitional physics. Uh, let me give you a brief example uh, of his, one of the fields of his studies. It's ferromagnetism. 
magnets uh, lose their magnetic properties when they're heated up to a high temperature. There is a change in their structure, which is due to uh, microscopic changes. The temperature changes continuously, and the microscopic uh, properties change suddenly. This is what's called the phase transition. That's what Hugo Dumenil studies on certain mathematical models. He creates a mathematical model and studies uh, the properties of the material and considers the material as a multitude of small uh, magnets which uh, orientate themselves in different uh, directions depending on the temperature. One of his current studies concerns the critical uh, temperature at which a phase transition takes place. However, this evening's subject concerns chance. Two weeks ago, a colloquium was uh, held um, about the share of chance in the universe. Today he's going to call into question the notion of uh, chance, and he's going to explain to us that uh, uh, some aspects of chance are deterministic, but the uh, real notion of chance is to be found at a different level. I'm sure he will be absolutely brilliant, despite the absence of a blackboard, which would have been his favorite uh, means for expressing himself this evening. Hugo, you have the floor. Good evening, one and all, and thank you very much for that introduction, which stresses me out a little bit. Uh, in any case, thank you. Thank you for coming. Uh, it's always a little bit uh, difficult at the beginning because you're thinking about 40 minutes of mathematical talk, and, uh, and I have to give it. Uh, I see that there are a lot of physicists here who could probably do a better job than I. Uh, so I'm not talking to them, I'm talking to the rest of you. Now, everybody calm down. I know that when a mathematician tells you not to uh, panic, that that's when you need to start panicking. But I'm going to make an effort. There won't be any mathematical formulae shown to you tonight. Uh, that's never a good uh, memory for any of us. And uh, no surprises at the end. I think, maybe not. OK, so what are we talking about? We're talking about chance or randomness. Uh, I'm not going to talk to you about all the way that uh, that can be defined, uh, contingency in philosophy, etc. I'm going to talk about the scientific notion here. Uh, so if there are any philosophers here, I apologize. I'm not going to get into that kind of a discussion with you. Now, where does the word come from? It comes from Arabic, dice game. What does it mean? It's the cause of a phenomena which is a, not a part of a deterministic process and which cannot be predicted. Cannot be predicted. I'm not saying that it's something that I can't predict, me personally, no. What I'm saying is, with all the tools that all of us have at our disposal, none of us can predict what will happen. So there is really a ch an element of randomness here in this event. Now, there was a, uh, a quote that you may have seen earlier where we were talking about undoing the best laid plans. And let's concentrate on those, uh, that part of that long quote from Paul Valéry. So chance is something that cannot be predicted. But when this word became a, a household word a few centuries ago, uh, Newton, Newtonian physics held sway. Uh, everything had a physical cause. And in particular, one of the uh, dreams of scientists at that time was that everything has a physical cause. And it was so strong that everyone seemed to believe it. Now, all of a sudden, chance it comes in to, uh, as a kind of a uh, tamper here against this idea. Uh, and 
people had to take uh, the uh, idea of uh, causality a little bit differently. So really, the question is, does randomness really exist? Or is it uh, just uh, something that exists because uh, we haven't really found the explanation? Perhaps everything has a cause, has a physical cause. And this is not an innocent question, to ask this question, does randomness exist or not? Now, OK, what do we, what do we mean by randomness? Well, usually people say uh, flipping a coin or rolling dice. Those are the two very typical public images of uh, randomness uh, or chance. I'm going to be using the two words. Uh, they're interchangeable. I'm not going to try to make a distinction between randomness and chance. OK, flipping a coin. What do you need? You need a coin and gravity. Those are the two things you need. Won't work in a space station. Uh, but here, coin, gravity, we flip the coin, we get heads or tails, and we have an equal return on this, about 50% uh, chance of one or the other. And this is used all the time uh, in, in daily life, sports, for example, the coin toss at the beginning of a match. And, uh, well, I'm, uh, I'm a uh, math major, and I'll, I have to play, be a geek for a few seconds here, but uh, double face, uh, the bad guy in Batman who uh, uses coins to decide whether people uh, live or die. That's my favorite uh, reference. But anyway, in the collective imagination, uh, flipping a coin is almost the definition of chance. But why do we think that? We think that because we can't predict the result. In other words, here, if I flip a coin, which I'm not going to do right now, I'll probably drop it on the floor. If I flip a coin, you agree with me that uh, neither I or anyone can understand or predict whether it will come down heads or tails. So here, chance is almost synonymous for our human brains. We cannot, in real time, predict the behavior of the coin. And this is what people say is a problem with too many parameters to figure out. But it actually isn't that complicated. What do we have here? We have a coin. And uh, when I uh, flip it, it has a rotational speed uh, at a certain uh, point in space. We can figure out the impact that that's going to have on the uh, coin, uh, how it will change the movement, and will hit the ground at a certain point. Here we have physical laws that can tell us or that can predict the way in which uh, the coin will bounce, how many times it will bounce. So uh, the laws of physics should allow us to correctly predict what is going to happen to this coin. So there's nothing random about this. OK, people are saying it, that's the theory. But with today's supercomputers, we can do simulations where we are able to predict how the coin will behave. So there are not that many parameters. Uh, there are not very many forces that are involved here. Some of them have no effect. And yet, we still can't predict. Uh, I go back to what I said earlier. People say there are too many parameters. But uh, this very simple system seems random to us. Uh, and to, to caricature a little bit, uh, let me in inject this into my uh, talk. There's a, a theory here, chaos theory. 
magnificent theory. Uh, what is it? It's a caricature of what's going on with this flipped coin. In other words, it's a simple system which is ultra sensitive to initial conditions. So it's going to seem totally random, but, and let me give you an example now to show you that it's not that complicated. Uh, close your eyes and imagine we're in our favorite tavern and we're playing a game of billiards. Sorry for those who don't know how to play billiards. Uh, and we're good. We're winning. Now, if you remember, at the end of a billiard match, billiard game, uh, it's kind of frustrating. You're ahead of your adversary, but you have the last shot, which is to put the white ball, the cue ball, after three bounces into the pocket. Uh, and this sometimes takes hours. It's totally random, and people aren't able to end the game. So imagine you strike the ball. Now be honest with yourself. Our brains understand fairly well what we need to do, not that we're able to do it, but we know that it's going to go in a straight line, bounce off the cushion at the same angle, and intuitively we know this. It's a calculation we make, and we're even ready to imagine what it's going to do after the second and even third bounce. So we try to calculate the right angle when we hit the cue ball so that it rebounds like that and makes it into the pocket. Why am I saying this? I'm saying this because we intuitively understand these physical systems. The, the, the brain seems to understand them intuitively. And yet, from this uh, simple system, we can create something which is totally random. Because a, a mathematician likes to complicate things, of course. Now, one of the things we can do is this. Uh, let's imagine a non-rectangular billiard table. We could imagine a circular table and one, and okay, only a mathematician would dream this kind of thing up, but you can see the other table here. Now, the little blue square, okay, I may not master the audiovisual here. Uh, you can see the uh, little points on this, one next to the other. Imagine that these are small balls, and watch what happens when we strike one. And what we see is the two things are not happening in the same way. We can see that on the right, uh, the balls here are staying fairly close together, and they're going back and forth in a rather orderly way. But to the left, we have a, a real mess. Uh, left uh, On the left-hand side, it's totally confusing. It, everything is uh, totally random. And if I, th I think if I uh, uh, s stopped the, the image right here, uh, no one would be able to predict uh, how things would be uh, uh, bouncing around uh, on that table. So that is a very clear example of randomness. Randomness, uh, just in the same way as the coin flip. Uh, that uh, is almost deterministic. Uh, we, we had a very simple system uh, that we used to create disorder here. I think you've all seen this in the center of this uh, image. You'll see that the, uh, the balls never enter the center of uh, the uh, table here. So we have a chaotic system on the left, but not on the right. 
Bref, pourquoi c'est important ce type de chaos Parce qu'en fait, what's important about this? Because this is the easiest way to create randomness. Not really and randomness, because we said that everything is determined. If we could understand the, the, the behavior of the balls here, but uh, here we're talking about the sensitivity to the initial condition. And this serves as a basis for almost all uh, uh, generators of uh, uh, random numbers. We take what we call chaotic functions and we create uh, random numbers. And the numbers that we obtain are considered to be sufficiently uh, uh, random, in other words, uh, sufficiently uncalculable through iterative means to be used in cryptography, something that's very important. In other words, these are the key elements to our cryptography systems. Now, is a system based on keys that are not random at all? Is there a function that gives this to us? Yes. So imagine someone who wants to uh, decrypt your uh, messages. Well, all he has to do is use this function. It's something that's a real problem. Now, by way of anecdote, let me, uh, uh, let me just say that uh, like mathematicians usually do, they flip a coin and say, this reminds me of a chaotic system. And uh, No, I'm not going to say that because that coin flip is not a chaotic system, but it is something that we can grasp with our minds. A chaotic system, to be a true one, the slightest, slightest influence, perturbation, gives us a totally different situation afterwards. And that's what happens with that system. Let's have some fun watching it again. So that system on the left is a true chaotic system. But, and that uh, doesn't apply to a coin flip. A very, very, very slight change will not uh, lead it to, to change heads or tails. But here, with this kind of a system, that uh, change, that influence has to be, can be so minuscule that it will change uh, the entire uh, outcome. So being sensitive to the initial condition. At this stage, what I wanted to tell you was that uh, everyday chance, chance at our level, is apparent chance. You've probably already heard people mention this. It's kind of subjective chance. It's uh, I, Hugo Dumenil, it's not possible to predict things. So uh, that's why I say that uh, when a, a coin is flipped, it's uh, a phenomenon of chance. But it's not a chance in the mathematical or physical sense. We said that mathematical chance has to resist all forms of prediction. Now, we've seen with the uh, chaotic systems that that's not the case. With a chaotic system, if you know the initial value and the function, then you can predict the behavior of the billiard ball. It will go in a straight line to start with and then rebound and so on. You can describe the whole trajectory. So we have to go a bit further than this to find genuine chance, or rather chance on a smaller scale. Now, uh, I have to be careful what I say because there are quite a few of, uh, quantum physics experts uh, in the room. We're going to do what I call a thought experiment. It's an experiment which is not done in a lab. That's typically what we do in maths. And uh, we like doing that in physics uh, a lot as well. We're going to uh, devise the following protocol. 
We're going to have three walls, so far so good, and they are well spaced out. In the first wall, this is going to be one hole. In the second wall, there are going to be two holes. We call them hole one and hole two, very imaginative. And in the last wall, there are going to be detectors. I've only drawn one, but imagine that they're going to be all over the place on that wall. Now, historically, in fact, we, we, you take a uh, submachine gun and you shoot uh, bullets, but that's maybe a bit too violent, so let's do it in a different way. You have to imagine that the uh, center, the transmitter, is a frenetic uh, billiard player. He's uh, striking them in all directions, uh, striking these uh, billiard balls in all directions. And our question is, what happens? More particularly, what happens here? There are many billiard balls which uh, rebound, which don't go through the holes, but some of them do manage to go through the holes, and they will arrive in our detec detector. The uh, detectors are, uh, for example, uh, uh, buckets of uh, sand, and we see what happens when they reach the third wall. This is a simulation. What you can see is that the balls appear one by one because we shoot them one by one, even though it's at a very fast rate, and they are distributed slightly uniformly. According to the following bell curve, a blue curve. Now, what is this curve? This curve, as it were, is the frequency at which the billiard balls arrive. Typically, in the center, it's uh, whiter than elsewhere. This is where more balls arrive than uh, other, at other places. There's a greater frequency of arrival of the balls in this area. The blue area represents the frequency. Now, here you can guess at what happens. Clearly, what's going to happen is that you're going to expect uh, some uh, balls to go through the hole, then they will arrive in the axis between the transmitter and hole one. Some of them rebound off the walls next to the holes, and of course the uh, shooter, the uh, transmitter, sends them in all directions. So it forms a bell shape like this. The balls that go through the hole create a second uh, bell. If I close one hole, what I get is that the balls arrive according to this uh, bell-shaped uh, frequency. That's uh, when hole one is uh, closed and when hole two is uh, closed. It's a different bell shape. If you open both the holes, the sum is the total of the balls that go through the respective holes. Balls go either through hole one or through hole two. A certain quantity go through hole one and a certain quantity through uh, two. So the frequency of arrival of the balls is the total of the number of balls that go through the two holes. So you may ask me what um, the connection is with our subject. Now we're going to go down one level, one level of scale. Instead of shooting billiard balls, we're going to shoot electrons. Now uh, maybe you're getting worried uh, about the direction in which this thought experiment is going to go. Now there is a system which corresponds exactly to the uh, electron uh, uh, gun, and that is the cathode ray tube. You can send electrons even one by one. It's something which is quite admirable. It's not as simple as all that to do, but it's feasible. Now imagine that our transmitter is uh, an electron gun, sending out electrons one by one. Good. So we're going to start the same experiment. We send uh, out electrons, but we close one of the holes. We open only hole one, and then we see what happens. Now when you see what happens, it's the same thing as for the billiard balls. So up to now we have not evolved very much. It's still the same story. If you open hole two and close uh, 
hole one, you will get the same distribution as for billiard balls. So the next stage, we're going to look at what happens when we open both holes. Now here we can, uh, if you like, do a kind of bet on what's going to happen. But if I give you a multiple choice question and uh, you're all going to uh, look at the physics section over here who know the answers and you're going to copy them. So we're not going to do that. We're not going to ask you what happens. We're just going to show you what happens. Bit of suspense. Well, here there's rather a lot of suspense. You cannot see anything now. One admirable thing is that the electrons arrive one by one. This is incredible, but it's due to the fact that electrons are particles. In other words, you really can measure them one by one. The second thing, which is much more admirable, is that you don't get the same thing as in the case of billiard balls at all, at all. I don't know whether I can stop this. If you see what's happening here, there are some areas which are completely black, which don't receive any electrons, and conversely, inversely, there are some areas which are very white, indeed very white, some areas which are very white, where there are many electrons that arrive. But imagine what has just happened. This is something very surprising. Maybe I'm not showing it to you very clearly. When you close one of the holes, number two, electrons arrive everywhere in the areas uh, that are black. But when I open the other hole, then these areas no longer receive any electrons at all. So the frequency curve, in that case, does not look at all like the sum of the curves. When I, uh, only, uh, when I open both the holes, it looks like this. I'm sure you've uh, realized that I'm not much good at uh, computing at IT, so I was unable to uh, rotate this video. Now I'm starting to panic a bit. <laughs> Don't move. I did not do a rotation, but you have to imagine this image as um, being rotated uh, through 90 degrees. And you obtain something completely different. You say now that there is interference involved. Now this might seem very strange to you because one has an impression of electrons which are particles and which come along one by one. Normally they go through hole one or hole two. We should obtain the sum of the frequencies, but we obtain in fact something which is completely different. And you, this is, we see something which you see very frequently with waves. If you take uh, waves um, in uh, Saint-Jean-de-Luz, uh, we had two uh, gaps uh, with waves and interference. Here it's the light that's uh, showing us interference. A very uh, interesting physical uh, physics uh, experiment which uh, shows us that light behaves in a wave-like fashion. And here we have the same type of interference as here. It's the Young's experiment. And this uh, tells us something which is connected with randomness. Now, in the next stage, what we can do is say, well, OK, we have these uh, interferences, but where do the electrons come from? Did the electrons come through hole one or two? That's a natural question to ask. To do this, Richard Fenman, a uh, Nobel Prize winner who uh, democratized this uh, idea, so the electrons um, react to light, so we'll just put a lamp in there. So we'll, we will put in a lamp. And roughly speaking, when the electrons go through, if they've gone through hole one, they will light up a small spot. If it's uh, through hole two, it will be at hole two, and we can record whether the particles have gone through uh, hole one or hole two, etc. The problem is that what you obtain in that case 
is exactly the same curve as for the billiard balls. The fact that these electrons were illuminated, it changed their behavior completely. And now the electrons behave exactly like billiard balls, and we obtain the sum. Now this is something which is well known in quantum physics, namely that when you measure a system, you modify it. You cannot measure a system without impacting it. But what is the connection with randomness? The, the connection with randomness is as follows. Imagine that there is a means of measuring whether the electron goes through hole one or hole two before it has uh, gone through, actually gone through hole one or hole two. In other words, uh, we put the detector just near the uh, transmitter and uh, we know which one is going through, going to go through hole one or hole two. Imagine that we could do that. It's easy to imagine in that case that um, the presence of the light source, um, see whether it's going through uh, one or two. You, it doesn't matter whether you put it because you have the information as to whether it's going to go through hole one or hole two. Now, what does that tell us? tells us that if there is no light source, we should nevertheless come up with the blue curve. So that means that we will be capable of saying whether um, the, the electrons are going to go through hole one or hole two without them actually going through. Then we have the sum of the frequencies of those that have gone through hole one and some of the frequencies of those that have gone through hole two. So we will end up with the sum of the frequencies. And uh, but we do witness interferences. That means that it's not possible to measure something, measure electrons to see whether they are going to go through hole one or hole two. So without this light, they pass through hole one or hole two completely randomly. There is no means in uh, predictive quantum physics to predict whether the electrons are going to go through hole one or hole two. It's totally random. This is a thought experiment. It's not all that simple to carry out. It's an experiment that was introduced for um, pedagogical purposes. I've just given you a crash course in quantum physics. Uh, we've seen quite a few bizarre quantum physics phenomena. We've seen uh, uh, duality in a particle and the fact that you impact a system when you measure something on it and this um, famous intrinsic phenomenon. Uh, Richard Feynman was an extraordinary educationalist and he used this thought experiment a lot in order to describe the rudiments of quantum physics. So this is a rapid uh, uh, rapid uh, class in quantum physics that I've just given you here, which you can tell your friends later over a drink. But in fact, this thought experiment was reproduced uh, recently, and you find this type of interference. First one was where uh, one hole was uh, closed, and then uh, with other options. Now, a number of experiments confirm randomness at uh, quantum level. And indeed, there are some even better experiments than this. This is not such a good experience, but it gives you a good idea of what is happening. There are some extraordinary experiments which justify the fact that uh, if one believes in quantum physics, there is an intrinsic objective randomness which does not depend on us. It's impossible to predict what is going to happen. Now, normally at this stage, you may be having some difficulty in believing me. Uh, this uh, existence of randomness is not possible. These physicists and mathematicians are crazy. But I'm going to teach you something. You are in a category of people, um, which there are quite a lot of people. And uh, this category of people includes Einstein. And uh, it's always nice to be in the same categories. Einstein. Even Einstein had some difficulty with this idea. It's this famous quotation. Uh, I'm sure um, he himself regretted having ever said this, namely, God does not play dice. This um, statement is not wrong. It's just that it's a stage, a stage at which we don't know enough. 
and one day we will have better theories that will explain to us better physics uh, without this randomness. Now, uh, Einstein uh, worked to try and uh, tell the physicists of that time and the physicists of the future that it's not such a good idea as all that to introduce elements of randomness. He developed some paradoxes. Uh, one of them is the EPR paradox, which uh, shows us that things will go badly if you make this kind of supposition. There are some superb experiments which use photographs. There's a whole uh, discipline uh, called quantum optics here. And this involves trying to prove the existence of this randomness. Now, Alan Aspey, 1983, showed that this uh, paradox was, in fact, not a paradox. All one has to do is renounce the locality. Maybe it's not so easy to renounce the idea of locality, but if one does uh, renounce it, then it's no longer a paradox. But now this experiment has been improved in Geneva, as it happens. We have some people who participated in that experiment here with us in the auditorium, so I'm not going to describe it in detail uh, because I may make a mistake. And uh, someone may... Uh, come down and pointed out to me uh, in no uncertain terms. But these experiments are great because they enable us to prove that this paradox is not a paradox, and it also enables us to prove much more effectively the presence of a fundamental, a fundamental randomness in quantum physics. It's not just uh, a figment of the mind. It's something which is intrinsic in quantum physics. It's uh, an interpretation which we call the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum physics, although some people resist and still uh, have some interpretations of quantum physics which are not based on, on chance. Now, the punchline of this presentation is that when you're a scientist, everything works axiomatically. I'm not claiming that that um, there is no description of the world which is not based on randomness. What I'm saying is that with mechanical physics and quantum physics, and I'm not the only one to say this, with these two forms of physics which are at our disposal, it's only normal to think that randomness governs the quantum world. That's uh, normal. That's the theoretical basis. Maybe the theory will be improved or in future and people will find out that there is no randomness. But axiomatically, if one believes in today's physics, the world is random. At least that's what I think. Now, uh, if you're wondering why scientists spend uh, so much time on proving that there is randomness in the world, apart from the fact that it's cool to do so, uh, the uh, experiment of Geneva and the works of uh, Professor Gison have enabled us to create um, genuine generators of random numbers. We use the quantum world to create this randomness. With today's knowledge, we know that it will be completely uh, random. So there are some real applications of these ideas which might uh, seem rather far-fetched to you at first sight. We've almost finished. Should we abandon the principle of deterministic causality? Should we abandon the idea, the principle, that each effect has a cause. This is not what quantum physics tell us. Quantum physics tells us something which is more measured in nature. It tells us that we have to forget about the idea of being able to determine whether an event takes place or not in quantum physics. But it does not tell us that we uh, cannot determine the probability that certain uh, events will take place. If we reflect about this, it's already a good thing. So, in fact, quantum physics enables us how to calculate the laws of probability. And these uh, laws of probability have a causality. So um, physics explains to us why it's that probability, not a different one. So there is a causality in determining the probability that, uh, with which events will happen. 
Well, uh, I'm a mathematician after all, so I uh, cannot possibly uh, give you this presentation without uh, giving you just one equation. There is Schrodinger, Schrodinger's uh, presentation, which you have here, which enables you to calculate uh, probability in a quantum system. It's not as uh, complicated as all that. In fact, when an uh, equation looks simple, it's, it turns out to be uh, complicated. So this one is not as complicated as all that. It enables you to calculate the laws of probability. So in summary, there is always a principle of causality. It's just that now we are determining the causes of probability and not uh, of uh, uh, events actually happening. Of, um. Now, when you look at this, there's something natural uh, comes to mind. It appears that we are introducing a new uh, player in the, to the game, probability. It's uh, crucial to understand what the prob probability of something is. I can see the maths uh, students uh, who are in the, uh, in the hall and uh, maybe they think I'm doing publicity for my classes. But uh, when you have something new, you have to have a theory of probabilities, how they can be added up, how can they be uh, manipulated, and, uh, and uh, this is a theory uh, in which I am a specialist. Let me just give you one example to uh, come full circle, and then maybe I will uh, show you one last slide. We've talked about objective and subjective uh, chance, subjective chance and objective chance. And subjective chance is our inability to understand things. But sometimes systems are too complicated for us to really understand the deterministic physics behind a system. So what can we do? Instead of saying, uh, oh my god, it's um, only subjective randomness, what we can do is to model this by means of probability. It's subjective randomness, but we will calculate the probability all the same, and that will help us to understand better what's happening. That's exactly what we do. When we study systems which depend on too many parameters, it, for example, the behavior of a molecule in a gas or an atom, it uh, collides with other uh, molecules. It's like uh, uh, hundreds of thousands or billions of billiard balls, um, which is difficult for the individual to understand. But here we model it by means of uh, randomness. Maybe it's randomness of the third type. The mathematician models this by means of probability. And here we manage to understand very uh, well what happens. There is no, uh, um, no pejorative uh, uh, idea in uh, randomness here. It has nothing, it's not, not a pejorative. Now, I'm just going to mention one law to you in particular. It's a law which uh, at the moment is uh, quite important due to topical events. This uh, theorem uh, we owe to Bernoulli, a member of a Swiss family of scientists are very well known. This theorem says the following thing. It's a mathematical theorem. It says that if you repeat an experiment n times, maybe 10,000 times, and you count the number of times at which uh, that the result a is obtained, so n a over n will be very close to the probability that the event will take place, that the result will be a. I will give you an example. Well, I've been uh, asked to do this. The first example is that if the probability that a coin uh, falls on heads, it's one out of two, if that probability is one out of two, and if we uh, flip uh, n coins, then it's uh, highly probable that you will have, uh, if you, if you uh, do it, 10, 000, if you flip the coin 10,000 times, then you'll probably have uh, heads about 5,000 times and about tails about 5,000 times. And if you flip a 
dice um, with six uh, sides, then it, there's a great probability that there will be n over 3, which will produce the result of 1 or 2. just wanted to briefly show you this video, uh, which made me laugh. It's uh, before a game, uh, uh, tossing a coin, and um, the coin fell on its uh, edge, fell on the edge. So just to show you that um, it doesn't necessarily have to be heads or tails, the result, that is, uh, it can be land the coin landing on its edge. Of course, the chance that it will, the coin will land on its edge just afterwards is very, very slim. What does this video tell us? That's the morale of these last two slides. When you see the events that take place, one tends to think that their probability is much greater than it actually is. Why? Because we totally forget the fact that many experiments are carried out. What's uh, happening here? Of course, there is uh, it's, um, the probability that uh, a, a coin will fall on its edge is very low. Probably no one in the room has experienced that. But um, there is already a very large number of football matches which take place in the world, and uh, people are flipping coins all the time. So occasionally it does happen. N A is uh, N times the probability. So if N is a very large number, if uh, an enormous number of people are flipping coins, then uh, sooner or later the event will occur. So you can probably see what I'm driving at now. Now, a cognitive bias um, is something which will be familiar to the physicians who are in the room. There's very little chance of uh, having a complicated side effect after vaccinating someone. But at the moment, we are trying to vaccinate all people on Earth. Uh, when I was born, there were about uh, 5 billion uh, people on Earth. Now we have over 7.5 uh, billion. Many, many people are getting vaccinated now. And even though there is a very low chance that people will uh, suffer a bad side effect, uh, our brains, which are not very good at calculating probability, will probably think that the probability is higher than it actually is. But each individual has a very low chance of uh, suffering a severe side effect. So much the better. So these large numbers tend to bias our uh, uh, cognition. So this is what probability is all about. Let me give you a final example. If you take uh, 23 pupils in a room, what is the probability that two of them will have uh, the same birthday date. I will help you by giving you some of the answers. The answer is either 5% or 15% or 50%. Just wait a moment, just wait a moment. So what is the probability that two pupils in a class of 23 pupils will have the same birthday date? 5%, 15% or 50%. I would like to thank you for your attention. Before giving you the answer, I would like to thank you for listening to me. And let me show you a video shot first of all. What is this video? Uh, you might be telling me uh, uh, your uh, randomness experiment and uh, shooting electrons. Uh, now, you may say to me uh, that you're never going to see this in everyday life. Uh, but this video shows you something which is genuine randomness. What is it? It's uranium mineral, uranium mineral, which of course is radioactive, and it uh, uh, emits uh, these charged particles. The probability that they will go in a uh, particular direction is uniform. They will go off in any direction. And they're surrounded by a gas, and when the particles go through, they excite the ions in the gas and they leave a trail like uh, the light which illuminates the electrons in my previous experiment here. This gas shows you precisely the direction taken by the charged particles when they go off in totally random directions. So this is genuine randomness. So I just wanted to end on a poetical note. I think it's almost hypnotic. It's, uh, 
who thinks the answer is 5%? Maybe I didn't give you the right percent. 15%? A few people think it's 15%. You have to reply. Everyone has to reply. We're not going to let nobody answer the question. And 50%? Well, you're right, it's 50%. And the law of large numbers tells us that in Geneva, uh, in Geneva, about uh, half of the classes have, at le have two pupils who have the same birthday date, who are born on the same day in the year. Thank you very much indeed for your attention. Okay, here you go. Come here. And Thierry Jamati, physics professor at the University of Geneva, is going to join us. Thierry Jamati is a specialist in disorder in classical and quantic, quantum systems. Uh, and he's here, uh, well, it's not a surprise, we, this is his field. We're going to take questions from internet and from the audience here. Now, let me f be the first. Uh, Hugo, you uh, were talking about different exper experiments here, some of which are quite complex. But is there some way we can actually see true randomness? Is it accessible? You don't even need uh, the uranium oxide here. You uh, you can do a similar experiment uh, yourself. But true randomness, uh, well, uh, when, lit, when you have sunglasses that are filtering uh, about half of the uh, light uh, that's uh, coming, what happens? So there are photons coming from the sun, and about half of them get through the sunglasses. Now, if you could identify one of those photons and wonder whether it's going to get through these sunglasses, you can't. It might get through, it might not. That's totally random. Uh, now, that might be a kind of a uh, silly example. I don't know, maybe you've got a better one. Well, we call a semi-reflective uh, uh, blade uh, that it does about the same thing. Either the photon gets through or it doesn't. And it's even used uh, by uh, professional generators of uh, a random uh, shadow. Uh, it's, uh, well, these things are sold, uh, they're out on the market, and there are even some portable f phones that have these and use them as uh, random generators. So, so we're even using uh, quantum physics on an industrial scale here. Uh, question from the house. Please wait for the mic. Good evening. Thank you for that presentation. I really liked the slide where uh, we had uh, the uh, uh, kind of twisted shape and we were able to see uh, the difference with a, uh, an orderly and or a chaotic system. Uh, I just wanted to have a little more explanation on that if I could. When we see on the twisted side slide on the left, the table, uh, we can see that the uh, balls take up all the space. It's kind of homogeneous. But in the circle, if I remember, uh, the uh, balls followed a kind of a circular pattern. So at one time in the left, the entire uh, surface was 
uh, in fact, covered homogeneously, chaotically, uh, and we could have uh, deduced its form because of that homogeneous uh, 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 occupation, which wasn't the case of the other. Um, I hope I've been clear. Uh, so there's a kind of a paradox where chaos engenders homogeneousness, whereas uh, uh, to the right, no chaos, but uh, very d difficult to, to see uh, if it's a circle or if it's a donut shape. Uh, I don't know. This is my first impression. This kind of kind of a paradox, where to the left we can identify the shape here, uh, whereas on the other side it's hard to identify a specific shape. Well, wh why call it a paradox? Uh, it doesn't go without saying that uh, randomness uh, is. Uh, uh, going to well, when the particles are going everywhere on the billiard table and are relatively homogeneously distributed, why is it paradoxical that that looks like something simpler? It's only because we're afraid of randomness. But if we just look at this as a theory like any other, things are working very well, and it's actually much simpler. Throwing up sand uh, at the beach uh, when it's a windy day, each. A particle of sand will bounce off the others. You're throwing them all up at the same time. But you can still see a kind of a global effect where the wind pushes these grains, or these uh, bits of stone, uh, sand, in the uh, uh, specific direction. Again, an example where uh, the probability theory simplify things often more simple to look at the average behavior of an object than its specific, uh, than the behavior of its specific elements. This shows the power of probability and physical statistics. To, it, it simplifies things. Uh, it uses chance to simplify things. So there's no paradox here. Uh, I, I fully agree. Let me add something. Uh, we're not going to do this here, but there is a way to show this. Uh, it has to be uniform because in a chaotic system, uh, it, to way to explore this is that each uh, uh, has the same, each element has the same probability. There was a uh, Boltzmann at the end of the 19th century realized that in order to deal with gas in this room, it wasn't any good to look at the individual trajectory of each molecule. That would be impossible. Too many of them, uh, the billions of billions in a very small volume. However, you could say, on the whole, each configuration that we could imagine uh, will happen with a certain probability. So instead of trying to uh, identify each individual trajectory, we're going to make a sum of things here and have a probability of that phenomenon. That's physical statistics, and it's been an extraordinary tool that has allowed us to deal with horribly complex systems, because we were able to discard a lot of difficulties that weren't really necessary. Uh, temperature, pressure, uh, uh, we weren't interested in whether the 28th molecule goes right or left. To, to calculate the pressure on the walls. So I agree with Hugo. There's a, a, a power of simplification here that you saw on the left rather than on the right, where, where we had to add more and more configurations uh, uh, randomly uh, because the system wasn't ergonic. So randomness is an ally of a physician, physicist here. We've used this, and it's allowed us to do some pretty extraordinary things. Let me go back to the billiard table. You showed us two uh, shapes uh, here. Can we continually deform one of the billiard tables? And uh, if we have that, what is there continuous change? Well, let's say that the 
chaos side is something that's very standard. It's very difficult to have billiards which are not chaotic in their behavior. And so as soon as you deform the sides of the billiard table, uh, you're going to be getting into a chaotic system. We've had several questions from the internet. First, what does it mean when we say probability two for an event that we can't measure many times? For example, the, what is the probability that it uh, it, that it'll rain on a specific day in 2025? <laughs> well, why do we have to repeat the experiment? Okay, we usually think of probability as being the average number of realizations of something, that we have to keep repeating the experiment to define that probability, but no. We don't need that. We can define probability from a single event. The important, what's important is what we do before the event takes place. In other words, before the event takes place, we can measure the chances that it will happen or not. But uh, just to doing it once, there's no problem with that. I think that this person is thinking about defining a probability as the frequency of appearance or occurrence. But that is not one of the prerequisites here. We don't need to repeat our experiments to define the probability of an event. Question from the House. Okay, good evening. Thank you for the uh, presentation. I have a question. You mentioned uh, the uh, quantum generators and uh, certain markers. Uh, I was uh, thinking that we might need other external elements, uh, for example, uh, outside utilizers so that this would be very random. I don't know if you could answer this. Well, let me try to comment on this. In quantum mechanics, as you pointed out, there is a deterministic element where we have a function of a wave function which has the system act deterministically, but when you carry out certain functions, such as measuring, you're introducing a probabilistic uh, uh, prediction, and no one has been able to disprove that probabilistic definition. If you're not happy with that, you have to change universes. Einstein tried, he failed. So we have that probabilistic uh, definition. Now, the way that you could use this on a practical level, uh, uh, you will need detectors and a certain number of uh, objects, uh, but um, the, uh, using uh, semi-reflective uh, uh, slides, well, you can run an experiment where you have uh, something that will generate zeros, ones uh, sequentially. You need a single photon source for this, but this can be done simply. And again, this is simple. Simple, following years of research, uh, but it's so, so simple that you've got it in your portable phone today. Uh, another question? First of all, I would uh, concur with the others who have congratulated you and those who will be doing it afterwards for your presentation. I'd like to go back to Einstein's quote that you uh, presented uh, when he said to Niels Bohr, another physicist, God doesn't play dice with the universe. Uh, well, you have to add what Niels Bohr replied the next morning after hearing that. Who are you, Einstein, to tell God what he should do? Okay, we're, we're getting into the danger zone here, says Hugo. Okay, but the story of that quote is uh, is pretty complex. 
because there was indeed a very strong debate and discussion uh, that took a long time to settle, maybe hasn't totally been settled, on how to interpret quantum physics here. Because uh, if you're uh, not very good at calculating probability, you would also have a hard time imagining what randomness is. So Einstein was a real pragmatist, a realist concerning physics, and it was di difficult for him to admit a final uh, solution here. So it's a real debate. Physicians who are still don't agree with this uh, uh, Copenhagen uh, interpretation uh, where things are based on randomness. It's, it's not a closed uh, debate. Things change constantly, and maybe in a few years, centuries, we'll find something new. Indeed, as it was as it pointed out, it, it was uh, uh, really hard to swallow this whole thing. The basic idea is that I prepare two objects in a certain way. I send one to uh, one end of the room, the other to the other end, and uh, you, they call, say they're socks, and you measure one and you find that it's blue, and instantly you know that the other sock is blue as well. Okay, so you might be surprised because uh, you'll think there's something that was transmitted instantaneously which would be in violation of relativity and so on. Uh, it's just kind of surprising. But then Einstein says that there's a hidden variable. So it's like classical randomness. We can't really see the whole thing. So you've got two blue socks, two red socks. Uh, if you measure one sock which, and it's blue, the other one's going to be blue. Now, unfortunately, as a, a, a physician, John Bell, showed we can't see whether equations that have slightly different uh, uh, variables, okay, red and blue, that's easy, but if it gets more complicated, or if you have a hidden variable that you haven't been able to see, you just have to run an experiment, like Alan Spee, and you can verify that that, that doesn't work. What you get is something that contradicts the idea of a hidden variable by, that is according to Einstein. There is no hidden variable. So this is something that has been verified. We've answered this experimentally. You cannot uh, soothe your conscience uh, concerning quantum mechanics by saying that you didn't have all the information at the outset. Uh, you weren't told that there were two blue objects, two red objects. Uh, you have to take the probabilities that are as described by Schrodinger. Now, emotionally, it's very disturbing. From a practical viewpoint, physicians know very well how to carry out these calculations, and there is no problem in uh, calculating and predicting using probabilities. It's just that we're uncomfortable with it. Uh, maybe someone will find an even greater theory of uh, quantum mechanics that can explain everything and even more for the time being. This isn't the case, but for the time being, uh, up to date, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, no one has been able to disprove uh, the quantum mechanics as we uh, have it now. This has been verified and re-verified in an absolute way. To pick up on this, there are at least two important points to mention. Quantum physics has an incredible predictive power. We have rarely uh, had in human experience um, possession of a theory which is uh, so highly predictive. But there are some people who really don't want to have anything to do with this randomness. The problem is that um, because of the way in which they introduce s solutions to uh, efface this randomness, uh, for example, it's been said that local hidden uh, 
variables don't uh, exist, so they've introduced uh, global vari variables which uh, breach our intuition even more. So at a certain point in time, we have to stop harming ourselves. We have to admit that uh, we may not be completely at ease with randomness, but there is worse than that. So in fact, this theory with uh, randomness is very elegant and very powerful, and we can live with it every day, I can assure you. I uh, can easily live with it. Anton, do you wish to take a question from our online viewers? How can one explain the deterministic appearance of uh, orbits of planets or galaxies when the uh, essential components of matter possess intrinsic randomness? Uh, would you like to reply? There are several reasons for this, says Professor Chiamachi. As regards the quantum physics part, I will let uh, Hugo reply. There are some stability theorems uh, which help us. Sometimes it's not so easy to have chaos, so sometimes mechanical physics is much more stable than one might think. Now, when you have uh, systems with a large number of degrees of freedom, in other words, with a large number of uh, molecules, there it's a chaos system. But a small system with just a, a solar system and a few planets, the conventional uh, mechanical physics theory uh, holds up fairly well there. But this is beyond my uh, field of specialization. Now, as regards quantum physics, there are all these questions of probability. As the scale gradually increases, you have uh, a factor which in, comes into play, and that is decoherence. That phenomenon means that you don't just have a half a chance of uh, observing the glass at a microscopical level at uh, the Edge of each edge of the table, after having uh, emptied the glasses, of course. But roughly speaking, these probabilistic laws are manifested much more at a small scale, if I may caricature things, and they very quickly disappear when you increase the size of the scale because of these decoherence phenomena. These phenomena are enemies of the manufacture of quantum computers in which people want to use the properties of quantum mechanics because in a conventional computer you have a lot of registers uh, uh, which will be used to calculate and you have to make everything work together without uh, decoherence uh, getting involved so you have to get out of the world of uh, quantum physics and move back into the world of mechanical physics. Uh, as regards, uh, I don't know whether I have much to add, says uh, Hugo, about Tokyo. There was only one theorem in the presentation that explains this uh, effect at large numbers. That's the law of large numbers. Often things repeat themselves, but we only see the averages. We've mentioned the uh, uh, circulation of gases. I don't feel the uh, force of each individual atom. I feel the overall force of all the uh, atoms, the n number of atoms. But since you have a re re repeated number of experiments, I'm going to feel the average of their force. That's what you feel every day. The law of large numbers is an explanation of uh, the fact that we don't feel that there is any randomness out there. Maybe we can take a question from the back of the room. Good evening. Thank you again for your excellent presentation. And thank you for having uh, included uh, the quotation from Paul Valéry in your presentation. Am I mistaken in saying that you propose a vision of the world in which the genuine randomness exists in the uh, microscopic level? And when you de-stack uh, 
coherence appears, do you envisage the possibility that um, at the end of the day, where we think true randomness is located is still an optical illusion, and that if we zoom even more, we will discover other things. That uh, may be what Einstein thought, that we had to push things even f further, and we had to transcend this probabilistic interpretation. Who am I to say whether Einstein was wrong or right? In any case, uh, knowledge is uh, progressing and maybe we'll arrive at other theories. Will those theories uh, systematically involve uh, randomness or chance? Uh, well, we don't know. But uh, your dis description was a very convincing description of today's world. But it's uh, difficult to make a prediction about uh, what the whole of humanity will come up with in the coming centuries. Professor Giamacci, I would like to pick up on what Hugo said in answer to your question. In the quantum world, we do have randomness as Hugo described it. Unless there is a super theory of quantum mechanics which enables us to think otherwise, there is no way we can predict what's going to happen. But I would like to stress the fact that uh, uh, the chance or the randomness that we have in the conventional world is not only true randomness, at the same time it's extremely important for our everyday life. If you look at the movement of all the molecules of air in this room, it's as random as you can possibly imagine. It's uh, randomness by default. You are not aware of all the initial conditions, of all the speeds, of all the molecules. So it is very important to also see the conventional classical world that surrounds us uh, based on a probabilistic and uh, random uh, description and also with the phase transition, as you mentioned uh, in the introduction, why does uh, uh, water change from a uh, liquid uh, phase to a solid phase. It's not because of the uh, rea interactions between the molecules, it's the way in which this randomness, the way in which these molecules of water will occupy different configurations which have changed, which will have changed slightly when you change the temperature. And that's very important for everything that we call macroscopic uh, phenomena, for example, phase transitions, phenomena in solids, and so on. We base all our theory on this randomness, and this gives us a predictive power and enables us to find physical phenomena which are remarkable. There was uh, a Nobel Prize winner called Philip W. Anderson, who recently died was one of the greatest uh, solid uh, physicians, uh, physicists, uh, physicists in uh, the modern world. And he said that more is different. It's uh, not that it's complicated, but it's different. You can find phenomena that don't exist if you have two, three, or four, or ten molecules. You will never have the phase transition which enables you to go from uh, water in the uh, liquid state to uh, solid state uh, ice with just uh, four molecules, you will never find that. To, to find that, you need uh, billions and billions of molecules. I must stress the fact that in, this, in our classical world, we have to cope with uh, randomness. And it's just as important as uh, looking for randomness uh, uh, in, uh, in quantum uh, mechanics. I propose that we uh, take just uh, two more questions from the room and one, two questions from the webinar. Just need a microphone. Is there a difference between a chaotic system and a non-chaotic system? Is there a clear-cut limit between the two? Or, or is it a blurred transition? 
Well, the um, mathematicians tend to be fairly binary in their definitions. A chaotic system is a system which, as soon as you modify, as soon as you make just an infinitesimal, or uh, I'll start over again. If you modify. <laughs> If you modify the initial conditions, even very slightly, you will obtain something completely different. It's not a chaotic system, it's complementary. It's a system in which it's possible to modify very slightly the initial conditions without really changing the behavior. So by definition, there is no third type. Afterwards, when you're not chaotic, there are different ways of um, not being chaotic, different ways of being more or less regular. Maybe I could add the physicist's uh, reply, which is between the two slightly. At the moment, a lot of research is being done to find out whether when you take a quantum system, they will thermalize. You take not uh, classical particles, but quantum objects, and you try to see what happens when you shake them and you then you let them rest to see whether they will reach a particular temperature. Now, many quantum systems thermalize nicely, but sometimes you have some systems where it may depend on the energy of the system. So you have some systems which thermalize very well, you change their energy and then they thermalize very poorly. This is something which is called quantum scars. I have a colleague uh, who's studying this at the University of uh, Geneva, Abenin. So uh, now sometimes the chaotic ones uh, thermalize uh, well, then you change the conditions and then they don't. According to mathematicians, they thermalize everywhere. <laughs> well, he's right, he's right. Uh, Hugo's right. By definition, a mathematician is always right, says Mr. Giamacci, Professor Giamacci. All we have to do is align ourselves, but the time scale over which the system may manifest its chaotic character may be very short or incredibly long. Well, can, as regards uh, study in physics, you could say that there is a phenomenon between two other phenomena which you would like to understand and uh, possibly master. A brief uh, online question. I'd like to end with a philosophical question. A few minutes ago, Thierry uh, proposed that we change a universe. Question, are there some mathematical models which are not uh, quantum and in which randomness, uh, in which random, randomness uh, uh, is involved? Could you repeat the question, please? Are there mathematical worlds which are not quantum and in which objective uh, randomness uh, arises. What is a mathematical world? Uh, it's a big question. I think that most mathematicians uh, try to understand the physical world. Of course, in mathematics, we have this pleasure of being able to make the rules more complex and to increase the dimensions. So we can, for example, introduce theoretical physics, which have not yet been verified. The theory of bodies, for example, which I don't have enough knowledge of. Uh, theoretically, one could imagine theories in which randomness would play a much smaller role. These theories uh, could, for example, unify uh, quantum mechanics and classical mechanics by moving towards a theory of everything. And this would uh, uh, involve uh, less reference to randomness. Now maybe this shows us, uh, well the very fact that this question has been asked shows us that we have many points of convergence between the world of mathematics and the world of physics. Physicists use mathematical tools on a daily basis. But the aim is different. In mathematics, the rules are defined by the mathematician or the mathematicians. And all you have to do is play around while respecting the rules. You have to be a good player and you have to define the rules. But after that, there are no limits. When you're a physicist, however, you don't make the rules. 
You may have theories, you may think that it's like this or like that, but at the end of the day, someone is going to conduct an experiment which will have to prove whether your predictions, your view of the world are correct or not. The rules are set by the experiment. If your theory agrees with what you see experimentally, you can keep it, whether you like it or not. We've talked about quantum mechanics. Uh, clearly, that did not uh, uh, please Einstein, but he had to put up with it. If your theory uh, does not concord with the experiment, does not agree with the experiment, then you have to trash it, however magnificent and elegant it may be. So the aims are different, and this means that uh, mathematicians have much more freedom to play with the different hypotheses. As far as physics are concerned, we're moving forward, and we'll see what happens. At the moment, we're right in the middle of randomness with quantum mechanics. Well, normally, uh, the, normally theories are not uh, trash. They end up on the desk of a mathematician who has fun with it. Because if someone imagined something like that, it would be a formidable tool and a formidable thing to study. Well, um, thank you for, for your comments. Uh, thank you very much indeed for your remarkable complementarity between the two of you. And thank you for reassuring us uh, about um, the presence of randomness in uh, everyday life. And uh, thank you for reassuring us about our computational abilities. To close, I would like to say a few words about the spectacle, the show, the Sound and Light show, Matt et Brian. It's uh, projected three times uh, in an evening. It's, uh, you don't need to wear a mask because it's outside. We invite you cordially to go and see it. It's just next door. And we would like to thank all the creators of the spectacle and all the people involved in this event. Have a nice evening.